Now, of course, we're just coming off of the prophecy week, and it's a little bit funny. I, I, didn't, I hadn't even considered this when I prepared my sermon. I prepared my sermon about a week ago for, for today, and um, th we're getting our main text passage from Joel chapter 2, which is all about the day of the Lord and you know, end times events and stuff, and we're not covering any of that this morning. So sorry if you're getting excited about Joel chapter 2. That's all this day of the Lord stuff, and, and it, it's, it's a really exciting chapter. The whole book is great, but... Um, I want to focus in on a verse. Actually, before I even do that, I'll just tell you what, we're, what I'm going to be teaching about this morning. I'm going to be preaching about fasting and fasting in the Christian life. Now, um, of course, fasting is simply just where you, where you withhold. Usually it's like food and water or just food from, from eating. You're, you're withholding that from yourself. And we see the teaching of fasting in the Bible, and I'm going to teach on that today. And it's a doctrine that you don't really seem to hear a whole lot about these days in Christian churches, just in general. You don't seem to hear a whole lot about this, this thing being taught, but I'm going to teach it this morning, and I'm going to get into the reason why I think we don't hear a whole lot about it. But the main reason for fasting, if you're ever curious, why do people fast in the Bible? The, the, the overwhelming majority of times that you'll see people fasting is because there's some kind of a serious problem going on. And you really need to get God's attention. Something drastic, something severe is happening in your life. And you are just trying to get a hold of God by any means possible. And you are just going to completely remove yourself and fast and, and, and afflict yourself to try to just, just really get a hold of God. So that's why you'll also find when, when you see references to fasting, there'll be fasting and prayer. You know, it, it, the two go hand in hand because you're, you should be continually giving yourself to prayer while you're fasting. In this, in this particular context, we see the day of the Lord. So it, it's, it's this great destruction and judgment that's coming upon the people. And he says in um, verse number 12, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. So... In the, the, the event that all of these, these terrible things are going to happen, he's saying, hey, turn to me, fast, weep, mourn. You know, usually these judgments of God, always these judgments of God come upon people when they're in great sin. And this, when this is going to happen, these events specifically, near the end times, or when, you know, the day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ comes back, the world is going to be in great sin. And what he's saying here to the people is, look, get right with me. Turn unto me and, and, you know, fast, weep, mourn, be sorry for, for all the sins that you've committed and just and humble yourselves and get right. And, and fasting is a very humbling event also. You're withholding food from yourself and, and I'm going to get into that a little bit too. But typical examples that we've seen in the past in the Bible, you think of King David when he commit his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Well, Bathsheba got pregnant, right? And that's how the whole thing kind of escalated. And he ended up killing her husband, Uriah the Hittite. He had him killed and he just compounded his sin. And one of the judgments of God upon David was that child was not going to live. As a result of David's sin, that child was not going to live. So when the child was stricken, when he was sick, when he was near unto death, what did David do? He fasted. He prayed, he mourned, he humbled himself because what he was trying to do is just get a hold of God and, and just trying to get that mercy from God. It was an extreme event in his life. His child was on, his, was on death's door. That was an example where, where we see fasting in the Bible. Another example was with, uh, with Esther, Queen Esther in the Bible. The whole book of Esther, when um, more... Um, Haman wanted to kill the Jews. He wanted to kill all the Jews of the land. Mordecai found out about it. And, of course, everyone found All the Jews found out about it. It was, it was a very uh, mournful event. And he told Esther, hey, you need to talk to the king and, and do something about this. <coughs> and she was concerned because she wasn't called unto the king. And only people who are called to the king were allowed to even go and, and speak to him. He has to call you. And if he doesn't call you and you just interrupt the king and you just go into his quarters or in his chambers... That's the death penalty. And the only way you can ever get any type of, of forgiveness for doing that is if he were to lay out his scepter towards you and basically forgive you himself for, for coming in to see him. So Esther was concerned about this. It's a big event. I mean, think about it. What if you were faced with something that you knew you had to do it, but you could possibly just completely lose your life over doing that? 
It's a, it's a fearful event. It's something that you're going to be thinking about and seriously concerned about, and you're going to want God's help, I mean, more than probably you've ever wanted His help in your life when you're facing possible death. And that's what she did. So she, she said, well, I'm going to fast. And she asked, you know, tell Mordecai, you know, tell, tell everybody to fast for me, fast with me. We're all going to you know, entreat God for three days. We're going to ask Him just to, you know, to look good upon me, and I'll go in and do this. That's another event where we see fasting. And then also with the people of Nineveh, if you remember Jonah, Jonah was the guy, that, the preacher that got swallowed by the whale and spit, you know, it's a great story. The kids love hearing that story, that, you know, the whale swallowing them up and getting spitting them back out on land. But what he was sent to do, he was sent to preach a very negative message to the people of Nineveh. He was, he was preaching destruction. He was preaching God's wrath coming down on their city because of their wickedness. Yeah. And he was sent into that city to go in and just preach and say, yet 40 days, you know, and the Lord's going to destroy Nineveh. So it's going to happen. And he did that. He went in, but the people of Nineveh received the message. And they humbled themselves. And they, re they believed the word of God. And then they realized, wow, we're wrong. Let's try to get a hold of God. Let, let's, let's do what we can to show you know, that, that we're sincere, to show that we're sorry, to, to humble ourselves. And they fasted. And they, you know, they put on um, sackcloth and ashes. You know, they, they completely humbled the way they dressed. They humbled themselves. And they, and they, they fasted to try to get mercy from God. These are all very, very significant, you know, bad events in people's lives, right? Serious things that they're facing. Now, that's the most common time that you're going to see people fasting in the Bible, but that's not the only time. So, the, you know, my first point I just want to mention is if you find yourself going through some very significant hard times in your life, it would be a good idea to consider fasting and humbling yourself when you pray unto God. Okay, this is, this, is, this is biblical. This is what we see throughout the Bible. Now, another time would be not just if, if it's outside circumstances, but also when you find yourself maybe getting involved in a serious sin. Okay, obviously we should be just keeping that out of our life completely, but let's face it, sometimes people get involved in bad sins. It happens. And it's not condoning it. It's not okay. But if you find yourself ever in that situation where you've done something and it's really bad, you ought to humble yourself, show your repentant heart unto God. First, you should repent and be like, you know, never do anything like that again, never want to do anything like that again, and go to God. But here we see in Joel chapter 2, this is kind of what he's telling the people here. In verse number 12, he says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. As I mentioned before, these people in Joel chapter 2 were in all kinds of wickedness and sin because this is at the time of the day of the Lord when, when the whole people that are going to be judged are, in, are into a lot of wickedness. And he's saying, turn to me. Turn to me with all of your heart. You know, fast, weep, mourn. And he says, and rend your heart. Rend means you're tearing your heart open. Right? Pour your heart out to God. Tear your heart open. That's what he wants to see. He wants to see your broken heart over what you've done. It's right. It's, it's the right thing to do. We live in a society today where people will tell you you just have to be happy all the time. Well, that's not true. And they'll say, if you're not happy, you need to go on some drug so that you can be happy. Look, don't fall into that lie. It's nonsense. Now, you shouldn't always just be sad and depressed. and you know, th That's not right either. But, and, and the solution's never just taking drugs. But, but there are times where we need to rend our heart. I mean, there's times where, you, where you know, if you do something bad, you ought to be sorry for it. You ought to grieve over that. You ought to mourn. Hey, if you lose a loved one, you know, that's something to be sad about too. It's okay to mourn over that for a while. And you know, people get scared, like, you know, someone loses a spouse or loses a child, and, and you know, they mourn for a month or two months or three months, and people start getting worried about them. Look, that's normal. Yeah. That's a serious event in your life. But we need to be able to to come to a place where we can mourn, where we can, especially when we get into sin. If we get into a bad sin, you really look, rend your heart. That's what God wants. He wants to see the change in your attitude. He wants to see the change in your heart. He wants to see you humble yourself and, and, and change. 
He says, and rend your heart and not your garments. Because what they would do, they would, they would, they would fast and they put on sackcloth and ashes. And what's way more important than your outward appearance is what's on the inside. He said, I'm looking at your heart. You can do all of the right steps. You could fast and you could put on, you know, the, the, the sackcloth and the ashes, so to speak. You know, you, you, could, you could really try to humble yourself from the outside. But if you're not humbled on the inside and breaking your heart, it's, it's of no value. Amen. Going through the motions of just saying, oh, like, like there's a story of the man, he's saying, I fast twice in the week. You know, I pay tithes of all that I have. And he was saying, you know, all these things. He said, oh, God, I thank you. I'm not like this publican here. Right? <laughs> He was going through the motions. He was performing his fast. He was paying his tithe. He was doing all these things. But his heart wasn't right. He was lifted up in pride. He's looking down on these other people. And the, guy, the man who just said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's the one who walked away justified. Even if he wasn't fasting, even if he wasn't doing these things, because it was what was in his heart. Because he humbled himself before God. Amen. And God saw his heart. So as we preach about fasting, just keep that in mind because I am going to focus more on actually doing the fasting. But the most important part is in your heart. It's not just a, a ritual, right? It, your heart has to be in it when you do the fast. That's the only way it's going to be acceptable with God yeah. when you fast unto the Lord is that your heart is in it. So he says here, rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So he's telling you, look, this is a good idea to do, even if you've already done some really bad things. Hey, God is merciful. He is gracious. He's reminding us that you don't just give up on everything and just say, well, I completely blew it. Even if you did blow it, even if, even if you got yourself in a mess like King David did, right? But he didn't just give up and just give up on his whole life and just be like, well, I could never serve God again. I screwed up and just go about depressed for the rest of his life. He got sorrowful. He repented. He rended his heart before God and, and, and he cried out for mercy and he fasted. But in the end, you know what? God still ended up using King David. His life wasn't over. He was able to keep moving forward and do things for the Lord. And we need to be able to keep that type of an attitude. And verse 14 of Joel chapter 2 says, Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Don't think all is lost. You find yourself committing a bad sin. Hey, repent. Turn unto the Lord. Get rid of that. You know, mourn and be grievous. You don't know if God will not bring a severe judgment upon you as a result. David deserved to die yeah. for his sin of committing adultery. That is what the law prescribed was the death penalty. Right. And God could have easily taken his life had he wanted to. Yeah. But he even extended... Now, David did pay for that sin. I mean, in this lifetime, there was, there was judgment that came upon him for sure. And we're never just going to get away with our sins in this life. It's just, it's not going to happen. But God can extend mercy on you. God can repent from bringing the judgment in the hard hand down on you and go much easier. I mean, the people of Nineveh is a great example. He was going to destroy and wipe out the entire city. No doubt about it. He was going to do it. But he saw them repent. He saw them turn from their wicked ways. He saw them do that, and then God changed his mind, and he said, okay, I'm not going to destroy this people. They humbled themselves. They fasted. They, they showed that, that they truly were sorry for all the things that they had done, and he decided not to destroy the city. Now, turn, if you would, to um, Ezra chapter number 8. Ezra chapter number 8. And I know these, you're like, Ezra, Joel, where are these books? <laughs> Turn back to Ezra chapter 8. I'm going to read for you from Psalm 69 before, um, while you're turning to Ezra 8. One of the things that fasting is supposed to do is to afflict or chasten your soul. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, your heart needs to be in it. This is something that goes down to your soul. 
Okay? In Psalm 69, verse 10, the Bible reads, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. So we see here, you're chastening your soul. You're, you're afflicting your soul when you fast. Ezra chapter number 8, we're going to look at verse number 21. Verse 21 says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of. So just to give you a little bit of understanding what's going on in this story, in the book of Ezra, it's regarding the rebuilding of Jerusalem. This is, this is, after, this is after the children of Israel were taken captive. They had gone into Babylon. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. In the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were given permission to go back into Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the temple. So now there's going to be this group of people that are traveling back from Babylon back into Jerusalem. And what he's saying here is that when they were leaving, you know, the king was basically going to provide them with whatever they needed. He's saying, okay, you know, I could give you what you want. And, and he was helping them out so they could have the supplies to build and stuff. But what, what he's saying here is that, well, we proclaim the fast because we told the king, hey, we don't need your protection. We don't need your soldiers to come with us into Jerusalem. Now, the way, of course, especially in those times, you know, it's not like now you, know, you could hop in your car, you could go on the highway, and you don't have to worry about being stopped and being robbed by people pretty much. I mean, unless you're, you're out of gas and you're going into a town, it's a real dark and seedy place, you pretty much don't have to worry about it. You know, it's, it's something we don't deal with as much today as it was back then. I mean, the traveling was much slower. It's a lot easier for people to rob you, you know, in your group. So they, this was a serious concern for them as they're going, especially with a group of people. You got women and children and you've got, you know, you're, you're not necessarily the most guarded. And they said, look, we don't need, we don't need your soldiers to help us because God will help us. God can protect us. And they were showing that they had faith in the Lord to watch over them and to bring them into the land safely. So because they said that to the king, they're not going to go back to him and be like, actually, can, do, you mind, do, you mind, do you mind giving us some security? Because you know, then it's going to show that they didn't, they didn't truly believe, they didn't truly have faith in the Lord. Right. So they're not going to do that because they did believe in God. So what they did, though, it says, I proclaimed a fast there that we might afflict ourselves. So they are entreating and seeking the Lord now very seriously and saying, God, you know, this is what we said unto the king. We know, we trust that you're able to, to, to protect us, but we want you, please protect us now. Don't, you know, show that we're right. Show, you know, you know, show yourself to us. We were, you know, so we fasted and besought our God for this and he was entreated of us and he heard them and, and they, they made it completely safely unharmed, no problems whatsoever along the way. So but here's another uh, place where they're, they're fasting, but it's also showing that they're afflicting their souls. So when we fast, it's something that you do. Now, if anyone, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because it doesn't matter. Fasting is something, I'm going to get to that in a minute, it's between you and God. Okay, it's something that no one else should have to worry about. Actually, I'll just cover that point right now. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to show you this. Because it is, it is a very important point. Fasting is something that you do that no one else needs to know about. Now, when I fast, my wife knows about it because she's the one who makes the meals for me, so I need to let her know, hey, I'm not eating, honey. But, <laughs> but, it, but it is something that, that, that you do that it's not supposed to be a big event and you're just going around like, oh, man, I'm so hungry. You know, I'm fasting and just, you know, just telling everybody about it. It just, man, this is terrible. I can't believe it. You know, and we'll see that in Matthew 6. We're going to see how we're supposed to, to deal with this when you do fast. So look at um, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 16. This is Jesus speaking, Matthew 6, 16. He says, moreover, when ye fast. And notice he uses the word when. So it's like something that's kind of expected, like when you fast, as if, as if it's a normal thing that you're going to be doing this. So when you fast... 
Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You know, these people, they're, they're the ones who are like, oh man, you know, they're walking around just, oh man, I'm hungry. You know, it's like, he says, look, that's a hypocrite. Yeah. They're drawing attention unto the fact that they're so holy and they're afflicting themselves for God. And that's what the Pharisees were all about. You know, they dress in their long flowing garments so that everybody can see. They love the greetings at the marketplace and the uppermost rooms at the feast. They wanted to be in the places of the highest honor and they reveled in that. That's what they were all about. They would say their long prayers just to show people how educated they were and how well they can pray and how well they could speak so that people could be awed by their you know, great spirituality. That's not what it's about at all. Amen. But there are plenty of people out there that want to make you think that way. Yeah. And fasting is one of those things that people can use to try to show you, hey, I'm this spiritual and I'm that spiritual and, and I'm doing this. Now, I believe that we should fast, but we ought to do it properly. Right. So let's keep reading here because he tells us when you fast, you know, don't, don't be like the hypocrites. He said, look, they have their reward. Yeah. Now, look, we're, we are looking for a reward from God. We're praying, we're entreating God for something in our life. So we want God to reward us. We don't want our reward to just be admiration of men. Because that's vanity. <laughs> it's not going to end up doing you any good if people are just so, so you know, look up to you so well. Okay, so what? Who cares? That's not going to get you what you really need. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 17. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. So you're trying to make, just look normal. Right? Nothing's wrong. Verse 18. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Just do it unto God. And that's what, you know, in the same chapter it talks about, you know, when you pray, go into a closet. You know, you don't have to pray in front of everybody. Just, just pray you personally to God. Hey, He's going to see that in secret and He'll reward you openly. He'll take care of that for you. Let's um, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'm going to make one point for you in Matthew 9. I probably could add you to it, but it's not, it's not that big of a deal. But, you know, people say, you find a lot of fasting in the Old Testament, and, and most of the scripture that we turned to in the beginning was all in the Old Testament. But should we fast in the New Testament? And, and I'll just read these, these references for you. In Matthew 9, 14, you know, these people came... Um, unto Jesus. He says, Then came to him the disciples of John, the disciples of John the Baptist. You know, people who were following John the Baptist came to Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft? Oft just means often. Why are we fasting often, but thy disciples fast not? So they're taking notice of this, that, that Jesus' disciples, when they were with him, they weren't fasting. They were eating. I mean, they were going about their work. They were doing things. And they kind of, they, they paid attention to this and said, wait a minute, you know, like, like we're fasting pretty often here. And the Pharisees are fasting pretty often, but how come your disciples aren't fasting often? And Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn? You know, as he equates fasting with mourning, yeah. right? It's a sad thing. I mean, you're, you're afflicting yourself, you're mourning. Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast. So he's saying, look, as long as Jesus was physically on this earth and with his disciples, there was no reason for them to mourn and to fast and to do all these things because he's right there with them. Right. They have no need of mourning. But, he says, when the bridegroom's taken from him, which happened, right, when he died on the cross, rose again, he's, he's, he's no longer on this earth walking around with him, he says, then shall they fast. Yeah. And that's where we're at today. Jesus Christ is no longer walking around on this earth with us, among us. It's, it's appropriate to fast and to, and to mourn and, and to afflict ourselves for him. So I had you turn to 1 Corinthians 17. So people say, okay, well, what should I be abstaining from? Because a fast is you're abstaining from something. I mentioned earlier, typically it's food and or water. Now, usually when I fast, I just fast with food and I abstain from food. But because you're afflicting your soul, there are other things that you ought to 
um, also withhold from yourself. And it's basically going to be any type of pleasures, right? You shouldn't be doing all kinds of, you know, entertainment things, for example, like, you know, going out, going to theme parks and stuff while you're fasting. Because the whole point is you're afflicting yourself, you're mourning, and you're trying to stay focused and getting hold of God. So doing all these things where you're just like, like doing all kinds of fun stuff is completely contrary to the point of the fast. Right. It's, it's not what it's all about. And if you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to see something else. The relationship that you have with your spouse is something that you also abstain from during the time of a fast. Again, that's another, play, another source of pleasure, something else that you find. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 4. And we see explained here about this relationship. The Bible says, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except... So here's the exception of when you, when you don't have that relationship with your spouse. He's saying, look, you're not your own. And, 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 you know, and I don't want to be very graphic here at all, because and, and, you know, I'm going to keep it in terms kind of similar to the Bible. When you get married and you have a spouse... You are supposed to, to be there for them when, when, you know, to meet their wants and their needs in that relationship. And that's why he says, you know what? The husband body is not his own, but the wife's. And likewise, hey, the wife's not her own, but the husband. So that both of you, it's a two-way street there. When, 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 when either one of you want to have that relationship, that you're there for them. And look, this is healthy, by the way. This is the cause of a lot of adultery that goes on is because of this. And this is something that if you're married that can help your marriage that you, that you think about these verses and just and realize, hey, this is right. This is what the Bible says. But here's the exception to that. He's saying there's one exception. There's one exception for when this rule is in place. He says, defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent. So you both agree to this. This is, this is what's consensual for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So the, the exception he gives is for fasting and prayer. Now, just to give you an idea of how long of a time this should be, I mean, how long can you really fast? Right? I mean, as, <laughs> it shouldn't be that long of a time that you're going without having a relationship with your wife or your husband. But um, he's saying that this is, this is the deal. You're, you're going you're to set a time and be like, okay, I'm fasting for a day or I'm fasting for two days or something. And you consent about that. And for that time, you are just withholding yourself from each other because you are afflicting your souls and you are keeping yourself from all pleasures, from all, from all of the things that would be gratifying to your flesh. Because let's face it, food is one of the ultimate gratifications to your flesh. When you get hungry, your body starts to tell you, hey, I'm hungry. And the longer you go, the more your body's like, hello, hello hey, hey, I'm down here. You know, can you get some food down this way? Like, like help me out here. And your body will, 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 will get more and more intense with the, the feelings and the urges to say, hey, give me some food. And what you're doing when you fast is that's an affliction. You're withholding something. Your body's trying, try screaming at you, hey, give me this. And you're saying, no, I'm not going to do that. And one of the things that, well, I'll get into that. I'll get into that later because there's, there's an extra truth that we're going to learn with the fasting. The, the main focus is on the prayer and, and the humbling yourself and afflicting your soul. But there's something else that we could learn from fasting. But turn, if you would, to um, Acts chapter 27. Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 27. Because then the next question people ask is, okay, well, I get that. You know, I, I withhold food, I withhold water, I withhold things that are kind of gratifying to me and pleasures and, and my relationship with my spouse. But um, how long should I do that for? Now, you'll find in the Bible mentioned a few different types of fasts. You'll see like, you know, a typical one might be one day or three days. Um, in an extreme case, you'll find 40 days. Moses fasted for 40 days in the mount, and Jesus fasted for 40 days when he was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. But that is not very common. And Moses actually fasted from food and water. So, I, I mean, he was supernaturally sustained when he was meeting face to face with God in the mount. That is not a normal event, and I don't suggest you, 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 know, you try doing a fast of 40 days without food and water because you'll, you'll probably die. 
okay? And the point that I'm going to make here is that there is no set amount of time prescribed in the Bible as being an acceptable fast that you must fast for this long. There are factors that are involved. And ultimately, I, wanna, I just want to make this point that make sure that you maintain your health when you fast because it is important. And what the reason, that's the reason why we turn to Acts 27. We're going to see in this story, this is when the, the Apostle Paul was on a boat. They're on a ship. And they're in the middle of this great storm. It's this tempest. And the people are worried and they're fasting and they're, you know, they're trying to make it, just trying to get out of this storm with their lives. And the Apostle Paul says this in verse 33. It says, And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, the meat just food, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. He's saying, Look, it's been two weeks. You've been fasting for two weeks, and I get it. You know, both, I'm all for fasting, but look, you need to take food. This is for your health. And think about the way that they're fasting. And, you know, like I know the way that I fasted. I don't have a very physically exerting job. You know, I sit out more in front of a computer, and I, it's not very taxing on my body. They're on a ship, man. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're hoisting sails and they're moving stuff around. They're using a lot more energy. So the food is going to be even more important. They're gone two weeks. And he's saying, look, you guys, you need to eat. You know, this is just for your health. This isn't good. You, you, need, you need to get some food in your body. Yeah. And everybody is different. And there are people that have health problems. And I'm not saying that, hey, if you have health problems, you need to be fasting for three days or you're not right with God. No, 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 no. Take your health into consideration. I mean, women who are pregnant, right? The baby needs to be getting nourished at such a young age. I'm not saying that you need to just be fasting during these times. So take that into consideration. Look, if your heart is right with God and you can establish a fast where it's going to be, you know, where you're not completely... Now look, fasting is uncomfortable. So don't be like, oh man, I'm really hurting my health because I've gone a day without food. Okay, it's not like that. So don't just, don't start deceiving yourself into thinking like, well, this is for my health, I just need to eat. Right? So, so, so take that for what it is. But if, when you ordain a fast and you, and you want to humble yourself and you want to afflict your soul, I would recommend setting in advance, this is how long I'm going to do it for. You know, one day, three days, what, what, whatever you want to do. And then keep to that. Stick to that. Don't give in to your flesh. And there's a lot that you could learn. It's, very, it's a very humbling experience. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read for you from Psalm 35. Fasting is very humbling. It's a good way to keep a humble heart. You know, as we, we sang the song this morning, Only a Sinner. Look, we need to maintain humility in our lives at all times. Pride goeth before destruction, the Bible says. Yeah. God will, if you get proud, God's going to bring you down. Amen. We need to maintain a humble heart, a humble attitude, and, and fasting is a great way to stay humble. I'll read for you while you're turning to Romans 6. Psalm 35, verse 12 says, They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or my br or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his, fa for his mother. So he said he humbled his soul with fasting for somebody else. And notice this, he wasn't even just focused on himself when he fasted here. He was worried about somebody else. So keep that in mind too. When you're thinking about maybe doing a fast for yourself, it doesn't always have to be just for you. The people with Esther, hey, she asked other people to fast for her, for what she was going to go do. When you, you might know people in their life that are going through some significant hardship and troubles in their life. Hey, it would be a good idea to humble yourself and fast and pray for them and for their experience of what they're going through. That's what David did here. And he's praying unto God here saying, look, you know, I, you know I did all this, God. I humbled myself. I fasted. I prayed for them. 
And they rewarded me evil. They, they were not a friend to me. I was being a friend to them, but they were being my enemy. And he's praying to God, you know, to take care of that because God's going to right every wrong. But turn, if you would, you're in Romans chapter 6. We need to make sure that we keep, obviously, that we keep ourselves from sin because sin brings us into bondage. And Romans 6 verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. He's saying, he's warning us, look, don't just give yourself over unto sin. And that's the motto of, well, if it feels good, do it. Right? When you're just saying, well, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, and just kind of give yourself over unto sin that you just start obeying these lusts of your flesh and just, and just being ruled by your lusts. Whatever they may be, whether it be towards someone of the opposite gender or even food or other things that you just indulge yourself, just completely indulge. In we live in a very indulgent society, yeah. right? Where it's just, it's all about indulging your senses and feeling good. Hey, he says, let not sin reign and be in control in your mortal body. We need to be in control. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That word yield just means like you're allowing. Don't allow your, your members, your, your, your body parts, basically your body to be used as instrument of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves or allow yourselves unto God, submit yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you allow sin in your life, you know, you will become a servant to that sin. If you just, just welcome it and say, okay, well, I'm just going to do this. Even though I know it's wrong, I'm just going to keep doing it. You're going to bring yourself, you think you're in control, you're going to end up bringing yourself into bondage without even realizing it. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, the Bible reads, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. This is the Apostle Paul in, first to, uh, in his letter to the Corinthians saying, I keep my under my body. I'm in control. I don't let my body dictate what I'm going to do. You know, if my body tells me, you know, hey, this, it, would, it would feel great to go get drunk tonight. So I'm not going to listen to my body and tell me to go do that. I'm going to bring my body in subjection. I'm in control here. I'm not going to let every, every whim or every lust that comes up in my heart or in my flesh just dictate what I'm going to do. No, my body is put in subjection. Now, anyone who's fasted should know this. Fasting will help build your strength to control your own body. Because the, 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 mo the strongest appetite you have is for food. Because you need it to survive, obviously. And if you're able to control yourself... And, and no matter how much hunger you feel, control that urge. It will help you to learn the discipline that you need to control your body in all areas. It is a good practice. It's a good repetition to get into to teach yourself and to understand for yourself, hey, I'm in control. So that way, maybe when you're not fasting and some other temptation arises in your life, you could be like, you know what? No, I've got control. I've got willpower. I can, I can make sure that I don't do this. Anyone who's ever fasted for, for a period of time, even for a day, I've noticed this. Like, you start fasting in the morning. Okay, yeah, you're hungry. You wake up, but not that big of a deal. Usually it just goes away. As the day progresses, I remember one day when we lived in, 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 uh, in Gilbert, I was heading home from work. I used to have a motorcycle. I was riding my motorcycle home, and it was during dinner time. And like I had fasted all day and I'm it's just like every little scent of food was just like, oh man, that smells so good. And it's so tempting to just want to eat. I mean, you're by, and, and it gets stronger and stronger. The more you go, it just gets this stronger urge. But keeping your body under subjection is a good exercise and, and will we'll let you know, hey, I am in control of this. I am not going to just, just be weak and allow myself to give in to all these temptations. And food, it's a, it's a good start. It's a great place to do that. And that could help strengthen you to deny yourself 
in many other areas of your life and many other lusts that you might have or problems that you might be struggling with. It'll, it'll build that confidence and help you to understand, no, I am in control. Even just in your mind, just mentally, like you're overcoming a desire. And, and primarily it's with the food, but hey, apply that anywhere. And, and, and it, it is very helpful. And if you, if you don't normally fast, and I don't mean like just have it on your schedule of like this is always the day I fast or something, but if you don't regularly fast, I mean, even a couple times a year, so whatever. Look, I'm, I'm not up here trying to say how often you should be fasting, but it, you, you should have it as part of your life. I believe it will help you. It will definitely help you, and, and it's a good thing to do anyways to get a hold of God. If, you, if, you're go, if things are going great in your life, and you're like, well, I don't even know why I should fast. I don't have you know, this, this, this serious reason to get a hold of God. Think about somebody else. There's got to be somebody that you know in your life that can use a good morning and fasting and prayer unto God to give them help in their life. I'm sure you could come up. And, and you know what? If you don't have anyone, keep coming to this church because we've got prayer requests. And there's often very, very serious prayers on this list where these people can definitely use some, some fasting and prayer. It happens, I mean, since, we st since I started doing this in this church, there has been someone out here. You see this Derek Ooms that's on here? He's got Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he's continuing to deteriorate, and, and he's, he's in a very, very bad state right now, and he's been on this list for a long time. And he could definitely use some of that fasting and prayer. And like I said, I I'm sure you probably have people that you know of in your life too. But if you don't, just keep coming here because I'll provide you somebody to pray for. <laughs> Okay, don't let that keep you out. But um, this, this denial of self is very important. Now, um, sin comes into our life ultimately when we allow ourselves to yield unto that temptation. That's when we end up sinning. The temptation's around us all the time. And here's a perfect example, especially for the guys. We live in a world where now, more than ever, we're bombarded with images. Right? The technology to put images out there with billboards just, just out on the street everywhere. Not just that, but where you know, they have internet technology and people are going on the computers and going online and you're going to different websites and there's images popping up everywhere. And two of the probably most popular places, especially in the younger generation, is like the social media, the, the, the Facebooks and the Twitters, and then the YouTubes and these videos and stuff. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of, lot of images that can be put in front of you that we are not, you ought to be looking at ever with your eyes. People put that up there. And you need, look, this can wear you down, especially for the men out there. The, the, the provocative images that are designed to just appeal to a man's lust. I mean, people do this to sell product. It's on the television. It's in commercials where they, they, they use women who are dressed immodestly to try to provoke a, a, you know, a, a primal instinct out of a man to, to desire that woman. And look, that's, that's wicked and that's wrong. Yeah. And if you find yourself being confronted with these images on a regular basis, you need to take a step just to get that out of your life. Because that's not right. And you say, yeah, but I'm not controlling. You know, look, then change your habits. Something needs to change. Now, online, you know, so like what I do, I have an ad blocker where you can't see any of these other ads, right? So it just completely, it just doesn't even ever show up. That's one of the ways that I deal with it. But if, there, if there's a point where like, like you're, you're seeing this stuff, maybe, maybe you're getting online too much. Maybe you're getting into the wrong thing. You need to cut that out. Because the bottom line is, if it, if it boils down to just saying, well, I can't control these things coming in and they keep coming up and they keep being put in front of my eyes, Maybe the best thing to do is just cut it out together. I mean, is it really going to kill you if you can't get on Facebook or you can't get on YouTube? I mean, oh, think about it seriously. Like, no, not my YouTube. Not my Facebook. No, please. I use it every day. I need to see it. But if that's an issue, I'm not saying it's an issue for everybody. I'm not saying that those images even pop up for everybody. But if it is, and if it's something that you are being bombarded with, hey, it's so much better to just get rid of that, to cut that out. You know, a similar analogy with Jesus said, look, it's better for you to pluck out your eye than to be cast into hellfire with both your eyes, right? And with a sin like that, like a sexual immoral sin and adultery, hey, it's much better to cut out the internet altogether if it needs to be, just if it needs to be cut out, than for you to be enticed and tempted and, and, and be weakened to the point to where you might commit adultery. 
I mean, Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust at her you know, with your eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart already. We need to, it, it's a very serious thing. We need to be on guard for that. And honestly, you might say, well, what does that have to do with fasting? Fasting is, is a way where you're identifying urges and lusts even ju just from the food alone. You're identifying that desire and you're, you're abstaining from it and you're withholding from it. And you'll find ways, it's be you'll find out if you start fasting a little bit more frequently, you'll be like, you know what, it's a little bit better for me if I'm not going around and sitting down, like, like it'd be a lot worse for me to, to, as my wife and kids are sitting down for dinner for me just to pull up a chair and sit down. They're like, look, I'm going to try to avoid that. Because that's just more of a temptation for me. I want to get through this and do this right. I'm just going to kind of work my schedule around. I'm going to stay in the office over here. Okay, I could tell they're having dinner. I'm going to stay over here and just, just keep myself distanced from that to help get myself through that. And you take these, these things that you learn and apply it everywhere. And we ought to apply that everywhere in all of the different lusts, all the things that, that might be a temptation for you. Say, hey, I'm going to keep my body in subjection. I am not going to allow this to, to rule over my life. I'm going to keep these things away from me. Now, one of the reasons why I think this teaching on fasting is, seems to be something that's gone by the wayside in today's Christian culture, it, it's probably because just in general, there's this overall abundance of wealth that God has blessed us with in general. I mean, people are so much more healthy and wealthy and well-fed that it almost seems like it's gone by the wayside, this, this, this whole idea and concept of fasting. We've grown very comfortable in our lives. Fasting is a way to make sure that we remain reliant on God. See, all of the things, you can be very successful right now and have a lot of things, and just like that, God can take those things away from you. It could be gone in a, in, a, in a second, in a day. It can all be taken away. And we need to make sure that we are just remaining reliant on God. And hey, if God has blessed you with, with, with financial success, praise the Lord. That's great for you. I'm, I am honestly happy for you if he's done that. And, and, and praise God for that. But just make sure that you can maintain a humble attitude and stay reliant on God from a day-to-day -day basis. And look, and if you don't have that financial success, it's okay. It just could be hope, you know, probably a little bit easier for you to rem remain reliant upon the Lord and looking to Him to, to meet your needs. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 8, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. It's a very wise, obviously, the Proverbs book of wisdom, very wise saying here. He's saying, look, don't God, he's a prayer, I say, look, God, don't, don't bring me into poverty, into the point where, like, I'm going to just be looking to steal bread and tempted to steal because I don't have anything and, and disobey your commandments. But he's saying also, you know what, don't give me a whole bunch of riches because I don't want to forget, you know, the Lord and, and just get lifted up in my pride and just feel like I don't need you for anything. He's saying, just, just please sustain me. Just, just, just help me to get by. And I don't need much. Just, just give me a little bit. And, and then I could, you know, he's saying, like, that's like the perfect place for me to be. Now, there's nothing inherently evil or wrong about being financially successful. Maybe you earn a good income. God's blessed you with financial riches. Hey, like I said before, praise the Lord for that. But just make sure to take heed for yourself because the more riches that you have, the easier it is to become indulgent in your life. It's, it's easier, and it could start with small things. You could see you start getting indulgent in food, and then you start to get indulgent in, in other areas, maybe taking a lot of vacation and, spending, you know, and going out and doing fun things. And again, there's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. There's nothing wrong with eating good food. There's nothing wrong with any of those things individually. But as you attain more wealth, it's easier to get more indulgent and to let that just, just take over you know, what you're all about and how you're spending your time. And... Um, we just need to make sure that you're not losing sight on what's truly important in this life because riches can be deceitful and can lead you into, into areas in, in spending your time in a way that, that's just complete vanity. I mean, think about it. Like the, 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 if you just, just had all of this money, you know, people say, oh, what would you do? Oh, I'd go to Europe. I'd go to Hawaii. I'd go to all these different places. And I'd go to the best restaurants. And I'd do all these things. And it's like, 
well, when, when are you going to serve God and when are you going to go to church and when you, you know, so you try to, I'm trying to be clear with what I'm saying because there's nothing wrong with taking a vacation, right? So don't get me wrong. I say, like, you can never go on a vacation or something like that or, or take a nice, you know, go out to a nice restaurant, but just make sure that we're keeping the right focus and that you don't just start replacing your service to God with other things because you find yourself being a little bit more wealthy. We need to maintain our service to God at all times and maintain our reliance upon Him. And no matter where you're at, and see, that's the good thing about fasting is that if you, if you do have a, a healthier, you know, like, like a, a more... Um, luxurious life or, or a little bit more uh, finances, fasting is a good way to keep yourself humble. So like you don't forget that, hey, I'm still relying on God. Because the more comfortable you get, the easier it is. I, I mean, that's, that's the way that all of us are. The more comfortable things get for you and you start, get, you, know, you start accumulating a little bit of a savings, you start to feel a little bit more secure and say, oh, okay, yeah, things are going great the less you're going to find yourself relying on God. But if you keep fasting a part of your Christian life, you're going to keep bringing yourself, afflicting your soul, and, 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 and saying, you know what, I'm still relying on God. So uh, hopefully you learned something a little bit new about, about fasting today. It, it, I do believe it's important for Christians, even today in 2015, to fast and to, and to utilize, as long as we do it you know, appropriately and, and for the right reasons, and that we're fasting to God with our heart and praying. And, um, of course, keep your health in consideration, too. Now, this is something that's between you and God, so you don't have to you know, tell, let anybody even know that you're fasting. God's the one who answers prayer, not man. And um, let's make sure that we, we, we do our fast and our prayer unto him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and, and for this teaching that we have regarding our fasting, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us to incorporate this into our lives as, as necessary, dear Lord, and that we don't forget this and that we can always remain reliant on you and that we can be in control of our own bodies, dear Lord, and that we don't yield ourselves servants unto sin but unto righteousness and that we can, we can gain the willpower necessary and that we can be strong in our life, dear Lord. And um, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.